Thank you for reminding me that I had turned my micro microphone off. So welcome everyone. Uh, we will uh, uh, begin with these uh, cases on bone pathology. Um, and uh, our uh, topic today uh, will cover a, a variety of areas. Um, we have several people from uh, various uh, points around the world. We welcome you all and hope this will be useful for you. Um, we have the chat box open. And so uh, if you have questions as we go along, uh, please feel free to type your questions uh, there uh, into the chat box. Uh, this first case, as I mentioned, a 37-year-old man who had the sudden onset of uh, uh, pain in his hip. He was a muscular fellow who enjoyed uh, lifting weights uh, and uh, developing his uh, uh, body habitus. Um, and from that, you might surmise that he might be someone who also used uh, anabolic steroids or other dietary supplements to uh, uh, accentuate his uh, muscular development. Uh, so as you know, that's a risk factor for avascular necrosis, which is what this uh, first case illustrates. Uh, and as I uh, was trying to explain, we have some zonation, areas of more normal bone, uh, a zone of uh, fibrosis in the marrow, and then an altered area here in the middle. Uh, so as we uh, come into uh, magnify this a little bit more, uh, we can see again that this is very acellular fibrous tissue here. Uh, we have um, a bit of dropout of uh, the nuclei in the uh, bone. And so uh, we might think about uh, uh, necrosis. Uh, <clears throat> of course, we define bone necrosis as a complete loss of uh, uh, nuclei in the lacunae, but uh, not every lacunae in a bone section will contain a nucleus. Uh, we can compare, however, the normal bone over here um, and look at some of the lacunae here uh, to see if uh, we have uh, good nuclear uh, features in some of these. And here we can see at least one there, uh, a few more up here uh, as more normal bone. Uh, here we see some, and, and here is a viable um, uh, lamella here, and we only see, you know, maybe about 50% uh, of the lacunae that have identifiable nuclei. So uh, you have to look at quite a few um, areas of the, the bony trabeculae to be sure that you're dealing with uh, true bone necrosis. Uh, the other feature that can help you in establishing bone necrosis, of course, is when you begin to get uh, um, the tissue surrounding it also being necrotic. Um, the caveat here, of course, is that uh, sometimes decalcification procedures uh, can make the nuclei really fade out. Uh, and so uh, if the nuclei begin to, <clears throat> to fade um, from decalcification, that will also show in any viable bone. Uh, so it's useful in, uh, in uh, large specimens. You have to, areas to compare, but not always in small specimens. And as we look at the um, um, marrow space here, it's obviously filled with uh, fibrin and uh, necrotic debris uh, that would uh, fit comfortably with the diagnosis of um, bone necrosis. Uh, and in this situation, a nice uh, corresponding uh, feature to avascular necrosis. So not a diagnostic challenge, uh, but it's one that I think illustrates a number of the issues that we encounter in uh, uh, assessing uh, bone viability and evaluation. Uh, the other feature here that is uh, of note is that there's some evidence that this may be a little bit chronic because as you see here on this and this area over here, there is an accentuation of the uh, bony architecture <clears throat> indicating that there'd been some uh, sort of buttressing, if you will, of this area of necrosis. So uh, although his onset of pain may have been sudden, the process may have actually been going on for some time because this degree of fibrosis uh, takes uh, uh, at least weeks and probably months to develop, uh, and that's an adequate amount of time to evaluate or to allow for there to be um, bony uh, remodeling adjacent to the, the lesion as well. <clears throat> so um, I guess you cannot, can you, can you see my, uh, my cursor when I move over the bone? That's, that's what I've been using as a pointer. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll use other annotation tools um, if I can here. Um, let's see. 
Uh, spotlight. So here's the area of uh, buttressing. Here's the area of uh, fibrosis. Here's the area of necrosis, um, uh, complete necrosis. Now, many of, much of the bone in this uh, fibrotic area is also uh, necrotic as well. All right, so I'm gonna go on to uh, the uh, next slide um, and uh, next case. And we will uh, talk about some other issues. <clears throat> so this is a, a thoracic spine um, lesion or uh, finding. A uh, patient was uh, autopsied and on uh, sectioning through the spine, uh, it became apparent that there was these uh, bulges into the um, surrounding interver intervertebral, or excuse me, into the uh, surrounding vertebral discs. Um, and uh, this is uh, obviously intervertebral disc cartilage. Um, these are normal cartilaginous tissues. So does this represent an abnormality or is it a, a normal finding? Well, obviously, usually the uh, intervertebral discs uh, have a little bit of an uh, arc to them. Uh, <clears throat> this is <clears throat> a finding that was first uh, reported in 1927, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, by a couple of German pathologists uh, based on autopsy findings. Um, and uh, this, these little herniations of intervertebral disc cartilage into the body of the vertebral body uh, were uh, reported and uh, they received the eponymic name of uh, Schmorl's nodes or Schmorl's nodules, that's S-C-H-M-O-R-L. Um, and uh, this is a, a normal finding that can be found in quite a high percentage of uh, uh, individuals uh, at autopsy. Uh, maybe higher than 50% in some series. Um, the other pathologist was one of my mentors, uh, Walter Puchar. Uh, and so in my institution, these were always referred to as Puchar schmoral nodules. Uh, they probably represent a minor degenerative phenomenon, um, but uh, they usually are asymptomatic and uh, not uh, causing a problem uh, unless they become large and uh, uh, interfere with the other, otherwise with the architecture of the uh, 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 spine. So it's just an interesting finding from autopsy, uh, a normal variant, so to speak, uh, that you may encounter if you do very much autopsy work. Again, I'll just mention for those who joined uh, recently, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to type them into the chat box, um, and uh, we will uh, try to address them as we go along. So the next case is uh, an adult who's had uh, this uh, lesion uh, in their uh, distal femur for some time, they've been aware of it, um, but there's been a uh, recent change. So as we look at the uh, uh, radiographic findings here, uh, we see that this is located in the medullary cavity. Uh, there's no distortion of the uh, cortex, um, and we have some internal calcifications uh, in the lesion, a little bit of a sort of rounded, bubbly space uh, type appearance. Uh, that uh, most radi radiologists would uh, term um, the, uh, the findings that you would expect with a cartilaginous lesion. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that might be uh, very easily marked off as a, uh, an enchondroma <clears throat> or uh, at least a low-grade lesion. However, the finding of uh, note here is that there's been a change in the, in the, pa in the patient's symptoms. And we can begin to see that there are also some changes in the uh, radiolucency of this uh, lesion. Uh, as you see, we have an area of lucency here distal and also an area of lucency here proximal and a little bit of clearing around the edge with maybe the very beginnings of some reactivity to uh, that uh, lesion. <clears throat> so this uh, begins to make uh, the case for potentially a more uh, or a change or some sort of de-differentiation type of an event. Um, so uh, looking at the microscopy, uh, we can see that we do have islands of uh, hyaline type cartilage. Um, and as we look at this, you know, we see that there's some pushing around the uh, existing bony trabeculae, maybe a little bit of new bone formation. 
Um, so this is a fairly low-grade hyaline cartilage type tissue. <clears throat> but as we look at this area, we see that you know, there are um, an increased number of cells, an increased number of lacunae uh, with uh, these uh, cartilaginous nuclei. We see that uh, some of them have uh, binucleate forms within a single lacunae, which is uh, an abnormal finding. Um, and there's a fair degree of uh, pleomorphism to some degree of these uh, nuclei, even though these are cartilage nuclei, uh, which we don't usually think of as pleomorphic, there is a, a degree of atypia here uh, and you might find some areas where you would have uh, nucleoli. So uh, if our biopsy was just of this type of a lesion, uh, we might well classify this as a low-grade chondrosarcoma, uh, particularly in a more central location like the uh, distal femur. Um, and uh, that would certainly be uh, adequate, but the treatment for that sort of a lesion uh, would be different uh, than the treatment for something with a higher grade area. Um, and so it's important to uh, properly sample these, these lesions so that the full picture comes into view. And here we see that there's something going on around this mature cartilage or more mature cartilage uh, in the form of this uh, spindle cell uh, and more pink tissue type of proliferation. Uh, so here we have a couple of islands of the pre-existing chondroid lesion. But then we have this uh, very cellular um, and not really well differentiated type of uh, lesion with a few scattered giant cells, some spindle shaped cells, uh, a little bit of vascularity, um, and obviously not just a reactive fibrosis from a, a fracture or something like that. So we have here um, the phenomenon of uh, dedifferentiation. So uh, there are a number of situations in the pathology where we, of course, encounter uh, dedifferentiation, um, endometrial tumors, uh, lipo lipomatous tumors, and so forth, some of the more common ones. But cartilage neoplasms also can dedifferentiate. Um, and the, the hallmarks are the radiographic findings of a change, change in symptoms, lucency around a, a more uh, indolent lesion, and uh, histologically, we look for a low-grade lesion, low-grade malignancy like this uh, low-grade chondrosarcoma with a uh, biphasic or more high-grade area um, adjacent to or um, uh, surrounding uh, that lesion. So our diagnosis on this case would be a dedifferentiated chondrosarcoma uh, arising from a low-grade uh, uh, chondrosarcoma. Uh, probably a, a, a chondroid lesion that had been present for some time. Now, if our biopsy were just of uh, this ty type of tissue, uh, we certainly could render the diagnosis of uh, spindle cell malignancy, probably high grade, uh, but we, if we didn't have the well-differentiated chondroid component, uh, it would be very difficult to classify this as a uh, um, dedifferentiated chondrosarcoma because there just is nothing in the way of differentiation in this tissue to uh, allow us to recognize that. So uh, with that said, do we have any questions about uh, dedifferentiated chondrosarcoma? If anyone have any questions? I know a number of you have uh, joined late or are joining, uh, so please don't hesitate to type your questions in or uh, unmute yourself and uh, speak up. Uh, I'll be happy to try to answer those questions as we go along. This is uh, designed to be a little bit interactive. That's one of the uh, benefits of Zoom is it allows us to uh, share ideas and uh, cases. So we'll go on to another uh, case. Um, not seeing any uh, questions popping up and don't, don't hesitate to ask about a previous case if uh, something comes to mind. Uh, or I don't uh, talk about something that you uh, noted on your slides. So this is uh, fragments of a, a soft tissue tumor in the proximal thigh in an adult. Um, and uh, I know from presenting and sharing this case with my uh, residents that uh, there were a number of things that uh, confused some of them. Uh, so I'll focus first on this area here, um, which uh, shows these large uh, cells with uh, very pink cytoplasm, peripheral nuclei, uh, 
and, uh, uh, you know, some degree of variability in size and shape. Um, and so some observers uh, in the early stages of training thought, well, could this be a rhabdomyosarcoma? Because these look like, uh, you know, rhabdoid cells. Um, and that would be a consideration, of course. Uh, but uh, there are a couple of things that give it away as not being rhabdomyosarcoma. First is the sort of lobulated architecture of these cells. Um, uh, that's one feature uh, that suggests that these are uh, atrophying skeletal muscle fibers uh, with uh, surrounding uh, fibrous tissue uh, rather than uh, rhabdomyoblasts and from a rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, so uh, that's one feature that we can use to differentiate uh, rhabdomyosarcoma is the nodular architecture of the uh, degenerating cells. Uh, multinucleation is another feature which will uh, uh, give you a clue. As you look at several of these, you see some of them have two or three nuclei or, and they tend to be peripheral. Um, and that's uh, what happens to skeletal muscle fibers as they've been uh, denervated or otherwise uh, altered is that the nuclei remain in the cell, the nuclei are not uh, degenerated, it's only the cytoplasm that's lost. Um, and so the nuclei remain and you get multinucleate bizarre cells. So uh, the other feature here is that the surrounding tissue is a fairly bland uh, fibroblastic tissue. So the abnormality uh, in this particular case uh, was uh, local, localized over here towards the uh, vascular bundle most, uh, most evidently where we have these uh, larger vessels. Um, and in between them, we see this um, proliferation of uh, somewhat epithelioid cells with some variable slit-like spaces and a lot of intervening and surrounding hemorrhage. Um, so this obviously lends itself towards thinking of an angiosarcoma um, and uh, that, uh, is, uh, is it in fact what we're dealing with here is this is an angiosarcoma. Um, many times angiosarcomas can be mistaken for epithelioid neoplasms, uh, carcinomas uh, in some circumstance, uh, or they can be mistaken for epithelioid sarcoma. Um, and uh, that's a particularly challenging uh, differential at certain times uh, because uh, many times in epithelioid sarcoma, you're dealing with a peripheral limb type lesion um, and the number of neoplastic cells relative to benign surrounding reactive uh, cells is uh, quite uh, limited. Um, and so those are two things to be considered. Um, differential histo immunohistochemistry, of course, can help you uh, by identifying things like uh, you know, CD31 or ERG or other vascular markers uh, in this uh, type of a lesion that would not be positive um, with a um, epithelioid sarcoma. Uh, just looking again at another area here, we see how this uh, tumor has uh, grown around uh, nerves. Um, here, as you can see, here's some nerve peripheral nerve trunks that have been uh, pretty well encompassed by the lesion. So that's another aspect of its behavior in this setting where it sort of mimics uh, an epithelial malignancy, which uh, is very prone to uh, uh, permeate around uh, uh, nerves and uh, so forth. Now, I also uh, put in uh, one additional slide here, which is, is just a side-by-side -side of two different areas uh, for you to compare. Um, and I won't spend a lot of time going down onto this because I think this, the features we've covered so far are sufficient. And there's many other things I'd like to tell you about here to, today. Um, so uh, we'll go on to the next case here, uh, which is um, a uh, left, excuse me, a right atrial mass. Um, oh, so before we do that, I see that uh, Sirion has asked a question about how to differentiate grade one chondrosarcoma from an enchondroma. Um, and uh, so that's a very good question. Um, because that is a difficult uh, determination. Um, and I grew up in an environment where location of the lesion uh, played a uh, big role in that uh, differential. differential. 
So if a lesion was located in the hand or distal, very distal extremities, as many enchondromas are, uh, you would accept a degree of atypia and maybe multinucleation in uh, the uh, lacunae uh, as still being an enchondroma. Whereas a lesion with the same features uh, located in the, a, a, a large long bone or in a flat bone um, would uh, be uh, classified as a low-grade chondrosarcoma. And, uh, and that's primarily a management issue. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference uh, in terms of, uh, of management. So um, the diagnosis of enchondroma, the diagnosis of low-grade uh, chondrosarcoma. Uh, that's not a critical decision uh, to, to differentiate um, because the management is going to be uh, essentially identical. They're going to curette the lesion, they're going to pack it with bone, um, and that's, and then they're going to follow the patient. Um, so that is essentially, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a moot question in that regard. And so I don't spend an inordinate amount of time on that. Um, if it's a central location, I'll usually call it a low-grade chondrosarcoma, just so that the surgeon feels justified in his, his therapy. But he's not going to do a, uh, a radical excision on a grade one chondrosarcoma. Um, and so he can curette it. He can follow it. Um, if it recurs, you know, or you can be aware of the potential for dedifferentiation. But if he's curetted the whole thing well, it's going to behave well. Okay, so uh, coming back to our intraatrial case, uh, this is a, a bit of a, a, a rare uh, bird. Uh, maybe it's a, a potted, spotted zebra or something of that sort. Uh, we don't see very many uh, intracardiac tumors and certainly don't see many uh, tumors of this sort uh, in an intracardiac location. I think in my entire lifetime, I've seen two of these. Uh, one is this case, and uh, one I think was in a, uh, a conference setting. It may have even been the same case, I don't know. Uh, but we have uh, areas of fibrin, we have a little bit of vascularity, uh, and then we have this uh, spindle-shaped proliferation here with uh, fairly cellular uh, and atypical cells, not high-grade malignancy per se, or not anaplastic, but uh, quite cellular. Uh, in these areas. So a, a spindle cell proliferation that looks like it's probably malignant, uh, it's got a bit degree of uh, fibrosis and the degree of change here. Um, I'll admit that some of my residents thought this might be an intraatrial myxoma. Uh, it does not at all resemble an intraatrial myxoma. Um, it uh, has a higher grade appearance than that would, much more cellular. Um, but uh, as we look around in this lesion, we can see, uh, again, some of those uh, localized areas that uh, give us a clue as to uh, histogenesis. Um, and so up here, we have little areas of uh, cartilaginous type tissue. Uh, again, higher cellularity, higher degree of nuclear pleomorphism. Um, this is sort of low-grade chondrosarcoma, this type of uh, tissue. But notice in comparison to the previous uh, uh, low-grade chondrosarcoma, the border of this merges very, uh, very gradually into the surrounding tissue. Now, in addition uh, to this, uh, this change, we have over here other areas where we're obviously making osteoid, we're making bone, uh, and some of this is getting uh, calcified. So um, it certainly would be unusual to have a reactive bone formation in uh, a cardiac uh, lesion. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, is this a primary extraskeletal uh, osteosarcoma? Um, so having bone tissue and cartilaginous tissue is uh, possible in several uh, bone forming lesions. Uh, by convention, we call this um, osteosarcoma if it's making bone um, and uh, use that criterion of finding atypical cells within the bony matrix uh, as sufficient justification for that diagnosis, irrespective of whether there's also atypical cartilage uh, present or not. 
so there's not a lot of this tissue here, uh, but this is the clue to the diagnosis. So we have some other areas over here where we have uh, more clear cut um, bone and cartilaginous tissue with some of these uh, atypical uh, nuclei in the bony lacunae. Um, and so this is uh, an extraskeletal um, osteosarcoma with areas of chondroid differentiation. Um, now, it's a very unusual thing to find this in the uh, heart, but uh, these have been reported. Um, and so, uh, you know, although uh, uh, it might be still a reportable kind of case, it, it would not be a totally unique and novel case because uh, it does exist in the literature. So any questions on uh, extraskeletal uh, osteosarcomas and uh, that differential? All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll look for some questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll go on to the next case. Uh, this is a very classic example. This is a 17-year-old uh, boy, well, actually, no, a 14-year-old boy. Um, and he had uh, the, persist the development of some pain in his leg near his knee, um, which was um, rather severe and uh, seemed to persist at night, uh, which is an important finding. Um, Um, so the question here, do we use SATB2 for uh, osteogenic sarcomas? I do not routinely use that. There are some circumstances where uh, we're beginning to use more immunohistochemistry, um, but uh, to this point, I would not say that's, I, I rely heavily still on the histology um, to uh, differentiate those sorts of things. Um, so radiographically here, we can see there's relatively little uh, abnormality. He's got open epiphyses, uh, both uh, in the tibia and the, in the femur, uh, also in the fibula. And uh, looking around, we can see really there's just this one little abnormality here, a slight thickening of the cortex here in the uh, um, metadiaphyseal juncture uh, with a little bit of central lucency. So uh, this is our abnormality um, that we're concerned about is this area right there. And we see it here on the, on the uh, lateral view right here. Uh, so it's very small. And on this view, you can see that there is this peripheral lucency with maybe a little suggestion of a central uh, calcification or uh, uh, increased uh, density. So uh, microscopically, here's the representative section. Uh, we can see that uh, we have um, a peripheral zone of uh, you know, cortical type bone. Then we have this little zone or, of uh, hypocellular um, area or less bone uh, that corresponds to that lucency with then uh, an area of um, abundant uh, bony matrix here in the center. Uh, and depending on the degree of calcification, this may still be lucent uh, because this uh, may not be fully uh, calcified. Um, now, as we look at this at higher magnification, uh, we see that this is uh, a, a somewhat atypical lesion. We've got uh, certainly high cellularity. We've got high degree of vascularity. Uh, and we have this osteoid encompassing um, osteocytes that are a little bit on the atypical side um, in this uh, sort of lesion. So if I'm looking at a high magnification view of this um, in isolation, I would have a very hard time to differentiate this from osteosarcoma because I would say, oh, it's a bone forming lesion. And this underscores the uh, uh, vital importance of uh, knowing what the radiographic appearance is and knowing the clinical history, uh, because if I uh, associate this lesion with what I just showed you radiographically, um, I would uh, never uh, dream of making the diagnosis of osteosarcoma, but would instead, uh, as Dr. Dat has said, uh, make the diagnosis of osteoid osteoma. So uh, the point in showing you this case is to illustrate that uh, 
uh, this bony form, bone forming matrix and this pattern um, is, uh, can be quite con concerning if you don't know the radiographic uh, setting uh, that you're seeing this in. Uh, so that becomes the uh, critical feature here. And we'll contrast this uh, later with other cases where we have uh, maybe some similar findings uh, to compare. Okay, let's go on to another case here. Um, this again, a uh, skeletal, mostly mature patient, uh, a little bit older, and he has a lesion here in the uh, distal femur. It's a lytic, partly lucent lesion. But as we look at this, we see uh, two things. One is it's centered in the epiphysis. So that's a very important uh, part of the history is knowing uh, the location within the bone. Is it metaphysis? Is it epiphysis? Is it diaphysis? Does it cross these boundaries? Uh, because that uh, changes your differential uh, enormously. Um, so uh, lesions that are located in the epiphysis uh, and that begin in the epiphysis are really quite limited in terms of differential diagnosis. And so most often the radiologist can look at this lesion and say, oh, this is a, a chondroblastoma. Um, and they would make that diagnosis on the basis of the location and the, uh, the, uh, the morphologic appearance. So the, the radiograph is really um, your gross uh, image to help you with this diagnosis. Um, we also see that the margins here are relatively sharply defined. There's a little bit of accentuation of uh, calcification at the edges of this. Uh, which is also characteristic of a slow-growing, not aggressive uh, lesion. All right, so let's uh, take a look at the uh, curated fragments. Uh, and this again tells you that the surgeon was not terribly concerned about this because he went ahead and, and curated the lesion. Uh, and as we look at this, we see there's, uh, again, sort of like that uh, dedifferentiated chondrosarcoma, there's some variable cellularity We've got these more pale pink areas and then other areas of uh, blue uh, tissue, uh, maybe a little suggestion of some vascularity or cystic uh, formation as well. Uh, so we'll go down and look at some of these uh, paler pink areas. Um, you might wonder, well, is this necrosis? Um, because it looks very pink like the nuclei have dropped out and there can be necrosis in these lesions. Uh, we do see the underlying architecture here and it looks a little bit chondroid. Um, in addition, there's a little bit of a sense of chondroid nature in the peripheral tissue uh, as well. Uh, we see giant cells in these lesions as with many bone lesions. And here's maybe the beginnings of a cyst lining. So underscoring that these lesions can become cystic at times. Um, we'll look a little bit more at some of this uh, pinkish tissue. Um, let's look in the other fragment. So here's some areas uh, where these more pale tissue areas uh, have uh, still viable uh, cells within them. Uh, and here, I think you can again see this uh, somewhat uh, chondroid-ish type of appearance. So it's a cartilage neoforming neoplasm um, and it has a degree of cellularity. Um, and it, it, because of that, it's believed that these stromal cells here are actually chondroblasts. And so it has that uh, name attached to it, uh, the chondroblastoma. Uh, but this is the characteristic appearance. Some areas of more um, uh, slightly immature cartilaginous tissue with a cellular, more blastic uh, surrounding uh, tissue associated with it. Now, sometimes uh, you can get necrosis, as we've indicated. Sometimes you can get calcification in these lesions that, uh, particularly in the uh, nearly necrotic area, that seems to be little rims of calcification around the uh, uh, nuclei, so-called chicken wire uh, calcification. And uh, I, I did post a video recently on uh, this lesion in isolation uh, for, for reference, uh, because it's uh, quite a nice classic lesion to be very familiar with. And it's really one of the very few lesions that occurs uh, principally and is centered in the uh, epiphysis. So uh, seeing a lesion in the epiphysis, the first two or three things you ought to think about would be chondroblastoma um, 
in that uh, location. So I think uh, in the interest of time, unless there's any questions, I'm gonna just uh, go forward to the next uh, case. Um, this is a uh, soft tissue mass, uh, which also involved bone located in the pelvis. Um, and the patient is a, an adult, older adult. Um, and this lesion also has uh, a cartilaginous uh, a relationship. So we see sort of this uh, bimorphic or uh, uh, dimorphic uh, pattern with some paler areas and some more blue cell type areas. Uh, we'll focus here first on these uh, paler areas and uh, you'll begin to recognize that this fits with our theme uh, that we're taking today. We have uh, a number of uh, uh, areas where we've got a sort of loose mixoid and somewhat chondroid appearance. Uh, so we don't have classic uh, chondroid lacunae uh, but we do have this sort of uh, matrix type of appearance around it that looks like a cartilaginous tissue, and it's fairly low grade in these locations. But then in addition, we have these peripheral areas where we have uh, more blue type cells. They like right here, we've got a cluster of small blue cells, um, not terribly unlike um, the uh, um, chondroblastoma that we just looked at, but this is obviously in a very different location. So it, we wouldn't even think chondroblastoma in this situation. Uh, so uh, looking a little further, uh, we can see that there are, um, you know, more of this tissue and it has this uh, sort of biphasic appearance. So uh, tumors that, uh, can have biphasic experience, uh, appearance. We mentioned already dedifferentiated chondrosarcoma, but this doesn't have the, uh, the clear-cut low-grade lesion. It's got the, the blastic appearance intimately associated with and surrounding the more um, um, chondroid areas like, like this. And so it's a, uh, a biphasic appearance, but that's very much intermingled one with another. Uh, we would want, of course, look and make sure we didn't find areas of osteoid. Uh, and sometimes pink tissue like this can uh, be mistaken for uh, osteoid. Um, if you're wondering about that, sometimes using polarized light uh, can be helpful uh, in uh, defining that um, uh, lesion as well. And uh, so uh, using uh, polarizing uh, microscopy, you'll see a different appearance with collagen uh, as opposed to uh, uh, osteoid, which will have a more uh, characteristic parallel line pattern. So this is uh, an example of a mesenchymal uh, chondrosarcoma. This is usually in a tumor of adults that can occur in a variety of locations from the head on down uh, to other areas of the body. Um, and it has this uh, bimorphic or biphasic uh, pattern of a, a small blue cell malignancy, like these kind of areas here, um, coupled with uh, areas of more I readily identifiable cartilaginous tissue. Um, and uh, I think it is in the differential uh, anytime you're seeing a cartilaginous neoplasm in a central location. Uh, but it also comes up in several situations where you may not be thinking bone type tumors. Uh, so it occurs in the orbit, uh, sometimes without an evident uh, bony connection. Uh, in the pelvis, sometimes it can have a very tenuous uh, bony connection as well. Uh, so that's an important thing to bear in mind that sometimes this type of a tumor can pop up in unusual locations where you're not first off thinking about bone tumors. Okay, so uh, I've got a couple of questions going back to uh, the uh, cardiac case. Uh, good thinking on this uh, lesion. Um, um, so the first question is, would we call this a poorly differentiated spindle cell sarcoma with osseous and cartilaginous metaplasia instead of extraskeletal osteosarcoma? Um, I, um, I, I'm a bit of a purist in that regard. I think if a tumor is uh, capable of making bone, uh, because osteosarcoma is, is, is so uh, 
significant a diagnosis, uh, you wouldn't want them to forego the treatment uh, that might be helpful in that situation. Uh, so I would prefer that it be that we that it be diagnosed as osteosarcoma um, in that situation. Um, if you find even those small areas. Now, if you if you didn't find convincing, um, uh, you know, neoplastic bone in the lesion, then I suppose that uh, a more descriptive diagnosis uh, like that would be uh, possible. Uh, question, next question, S100 done. So S100 can be useful in identifying uh, uh, cartilaginous cells. Uh, it could be useful in uh, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. Uh, I believe there's some specific uh, mutations that are associated with mesenchymal chondrosarcoma that can also help to nail down that diagnosis, but I don't have them right at the tip of my tongue. And then uh, Dr. Tu asks uh, whether the cardiac tumor could be myositis ossificans. Uh, and how can we differentiate that? Um, well, this is a, a situation, that's a situation where potentially, uh, I think the uh, STAT-6 might be helpful uh, if you were seriously considering a myositis ossificans. Um, myositis ossificans, though, generally has a, a greater degree of zonation. Uh, and that, that might be hard to, to determine in our uh, sample because uh, we don't really have the full lesion. Uh, but if you have a resected lesion, say from a, a, a muscle or something like that, uh, typically there will be some uh, degree of uh, zonation where you'll see at the periphery one particular type of uh, morphology, the center, center will be uh, of a different morphology. Um, and so that can be helpful uh, in terms of that differential. Uh, so I use that morphologically um, along with uh, the, also the degree of uh, atypia and pleomorphism, I think is usually greater in uh, osteosarcoma than in myositis. But myositis ossificans can be very mitotically active. Uh, and so it could be a, a consideration there as well. So good questions. All right, let's uh, go on to the next case here. Um, um, this is a uh, patient who uh, is a construction worker, and he suddenly develops um, uh, pain and inability to ambulate. And in fact, he's found to have a, uh, a pathologic fracture. So we see that his articular surfaces are still in pretty good shape. Um, and just to compare here, uh, this is uh, more normal uh, marrow here, which we can see has a mixture of cell types um, and the uh, uh, features that suggest uh, hematopoiesis, uh, a few megakaryocytes, clusters of uh, um, hem hematogenous cells. Uh, in contrast, uh, down here at the uh, base of the lesion, uh, we have a marrow space which looks a little bit similar to that. Uh, but uh, as we look here, we see that uh, this has a, an additional population of cells in it. Very kind of, uh, uh, well, maybe plasmacytoid, signet ring type pattern cells, a few multinucleus cells. These do not look like, they're big cells. Uh, they do not look like uh, usual hematopoietic cells. And so uh, in this sort of situation, you know, thinking about myeloma, thinking about metastatic carcinoma uh, would be a reasonable possibility. Now we also see that uh, as we go further into this area here, uh, that uh, there is considerable uh, bone resorption going on here. And uh, I just wanted to illustrate this here. Uh, when you see this sort of scalloping appearance, um, with these little funny looking indentations into the bone, uh, it's an in, it's indi indication of bone resorption. So you may find some osteoclasts like this, but notice that we also have some uh, tumor cells here, uh, some of these other abnormal cells. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, metabolic processes like uh, uh, Gaucher's disease and things like that, they might have cells that you know, have this sort of foamy uh, cytoplasm like we see here, but they would not be <clears throat> causing this kind of bone resorption and scalloping of the native bone, which is obviously what uh, weakened the bone and led to the pathologic fracture. 
So this is a uh, uh, situation where immunohistochemistry is going to come in. And this illustrates, I think, again, the importance to think about um, how you're going to use immunohistochemistry in a case like this and to consider what the impact will be of uh, decalcification. So typically, uh, decalcification using acid will also affect the uh, reactivity of many of the antigens that we rely on uh, in immunohistochemistry. Uh, on the other hand, using EDTA, um, a chelating agent to decalcify bone, uh, does not have the same damaging effect on uh, the immunohistochemistry. And so um, considering whether or not you may want to use EDTA uh, as a partial decalcification procedure, if you're going to have to do immunohistochemistry is a valid consideration. If you um, only have access to acid decalcification, then you may have to look at uh, doing a variety of validation studies and optimizing your immunochemistry uh, processes so that uh, you can rely upon those answers. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, immunohistochemistry is performed in the developing world where uh, the validation of the reactivity of the antibody with the specific processing uh, method that has been used has not been carried out with any uh, degree of rigor. And so um, it's very common uh, in that circumstance to have false negative reactions. And that really doesn't help you or the patient. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, properly validate your immunohistochemistries um, to make sure that uh, you can uh, predict um, the uh, reactivity reliably uh, based on enough sample. How many is enough? Well, I would say, you know, certainly more than one, uh, but probably several, ideally uh, 10 or 20 uh, should be done to uh, fully validate both positive and negative reactivities uh, in a decalcified or otherwise fixed and handled uh, specimen. So uh, this uh, turned out to be a metastatic uh, adenocarcinoma of the lung. Uh, the patient was a smoker uh, and uh, had a pathologic fracture and obviously stage four disease that uh, uh, required uh, tr um, uh, some fairly aggressive treatment. Now, the other thing about EDTA decalcification is that we'll also preserve the capability to do molecular analyses, which uh, acid decalcification would not do. Okay, let's go on to the next case here. How are we doing on time? We've got the time. This is obviously a, uh, a gross lesion, a very uh, large lesion here in the mid shaft of uh, the femur, or excuse me, of the uh, tibia. Um, and again, we can see that this is, has a fairly low grade appearance. Um, it uh, doesn't appear to go beyond. Um, it's expanded and distorted the bone without destroying it or you know, permeating into the surrounding soft tissues. Uh, so that's an important understanding to sort of characterize the behavior of this lesion. Um, now, as we look at this lesion under the microscope, uh, you'll immediately begin to recognize, uh, well, this does have a sharp border here like that. There's that sharp border, but it's expanded the cortex and maybe starting to push through in a few areas like this. Uh, so it isn't totally bland in that regard, uh, but it's uh, certainly uh, uh, not uh, permeate, permeating the uh, marrow in a wild uh, fashion. As we look at this under higher magnification, uh, I hope you can see right off the bat the resemblance to the osteoid osteoma. Uh, so again, on high magnification, uh, small biopsy sample, uh, this is a bone-forming neoplasm, and, uh, and that's kind of where you stop, because there's a little bit of atypia here. I don't see atypical mitoses per se, but it's highly vascularized. It's making bone. Um, I would have a difficult time differentiating this microscopic field from osteoma, from some osteosarcomas. And so on this situation, again, it's important to evaluate the um, radiograph <clears throat> to make sure you, you, that you are dealing with, um, and that you're not gonna make a misdiagnosis. Um, 
Now, osteoblastomas, as this is a, a case, uh, look, as we said, very similar to osteoid osteomas. They are bigger, um, and they don't tend to have that uh, peripheral zone of lucency, um, although they will have this sharp border. So here you see that you've got the osteoid forming tissue uh, right up against the pre-existing bone uh, without a, a, a zone of sparing or a zone of reactivity. Uh, there are uh, situations where osteoid osteoma, excuse me, where osteoblastoma can be aggressive uh, and can behave like a low-grade uh, sarcoma in terms of local destruction. And here may be a, a clue that, that that's going on as it pushes through uh, this uh, canal. This out here is a new bone formation uh, that's been made as the periosteum has been elevated. So uh, again, the, the, the teaching point of this case is look at the radiograph, bone forming neoplasm can be distinguished on a high microscopic uh, view from osteoid osteoma or even from an osteosarcoma. Now, whether or not this lesion derives from a, uh, uh, an osteoid osteoma, we don't know. Typically, the pain is not as severe with this lesion, uh, but it may have a nidus that looks like this, where you've got more calcification. Uh, so another question from Dr. Tu about decalcification procedures. Um, we, uh, we recommend, uh, in, our, in our laboratory, we use uh, EDTA uh, as the decalcification solution. Whoops. Oh, everyone. So we use uh, EDTA, um, and that is a, a, it is something that takes a longer time period, uh, but is uh, much more gentle with the uh, um, antigens that you're trying to expose. Uh, now, if you are using formic acid and you you preserve your antigens, that's uh, that's that's accomplishing your purpose, but you're right that it does take uh, much longer with these uh, more gentle methods to leach out the uh, the uh, uh, calcium and to make it uh, viable to, or malleable to to cut. So that's the that's the disadvantage. All right. Well, let's uh, see if we can get a couple more of our cases uh, shown here. Uh, here is another lesion, and I show you this case uh, for, it's a very, very classic case. Uh, this is uh, the radiographic appearance that uh, many radiologists will say is a soap bubble lesion. Uh, and by that, they mean it's got a lot of uh, sort of rounded spaces with a little peripheral rim of accentuation. Uh, and here you can see it's distorted the, uh, the cortex, um, maybe partially destroyed it. Uh, but it does appear that it's probably not extending into the soft tissue, but it's got these nice rounded spaces. In terms of location, we see that it crosses the epiphysis. So this is a metaphysis and epiphysis uh, lesion, or what we say, meta-epiphyseal uh, lesion. Uh, so that, again, there are several lesions that do both. Uh, giant cell tumor would be a consideration, but giant cell tumor usually does not have this soap bubble appearance. Usually this is again, suggesting a cartilaginous lesion. Um, and so uh, here we're looking at uh, the lesion. Uh, the tissue what you see has a vaguely uniform or mostly uniform appearance as opposed to those dimorphic uh, things that we've uh, um, thought about. Um, and uh, the uh, tissue has a, a little bit of this blue chondroid-like matrix. Um, so it's a very sort of uh, loose uh, bluish matrix. Um, and other areas look a little bit more uh, mixoid, maybe we'd say. Uh, so this uh, lesion, you can almost make the diagnosis by just describing it. Um, it's a low cellularity lesion. It's got this uh, mixoid and cartilaginous uh, matrix. Uh, and uh, if we add then a few areas where it's maybe a little bit more fibrotic, like right here, um, maybe we would uh, come up with the name on our own of a chondromyxoid fibroma. Uh, which is the diagnosis in this case. 
these lesions uh, typically uh, begin in the cortex, but they can be in the uh, epiphysis, or excuse me, in the metaphysis and epiphysis, um, and they'll have this nice uh, uh, soap bubble appearance in many circumstances, which indicates that the periphery, although there's no uh, there's no car, uh, uh, calcification in this portion, but the periphery has time to react uh, and build a little bit of uh, wall around it. Okay, so uh, a couple of questions going back here uh, with regard to the uh, pathologic fracture, uh, Erdheim-Chester disease. Uh, so that is, a, a, I think, part of the consideration with those foamy ma macrophages. I mentioned Gaucher's disease, that's another consideration. Um, and so uh, I think including those sorts of things in the differential is important, but usually those don't lead to um, um, pathologic fractures. Um, so, and then the question about uh, how do we produce a large slide with all the tumor in it? <laughs> well, uh, you get good de decalcification and you have good histo histotechnologists who are comfortable working with, uh, with large, larger sections. These were processed, of course, still in standard cassettes, you know, of uh, uh, roughly, uh, you know, three by three millimeter, three by three centimeters. Uh, so they're not uh, that huge in that regard, but uh, we did uh, we did get good sections from our histotechs. All right, so uh, chondromyxoid fibroma, uh, another lesion in the chondroid differential diagnosis. Um, this lesion, uh, again, I did a video on this a few uh, months ago, um, a uh, patient with pain in his knee and this soft tissue mass, which we see here is entirely extracortical, doesn't involve the cortex on this uh, MRI, uh, young patient, um, still with open epiphyses. And uh, this is just presented as a nice histologic differential comparing to the chondromyxoid fibroma. This is a, uh, a pure uh, myxomatous type of lesion without the uh, chondroid elements. Uh, so for contrast, seeing this uh, myxoid tissue here, <clears throat> And this lesion um, is a little different from the uh, intramuscular myxoma. Uh, this tends to be lobulated. It tends to occur adjacent to um, large uh, joints. Uh, you can have calcification in it occasionally if it's a poorly cellular, uh, but this is actually not calcification. This is just uh, an area where it got cut more thickly uh, and so the uh, mucopolysaccharides uh, stain more abundantly. Uh, so a chondromyxoid fibroma also enters into the differential. Okay, we're right at 8.15, but I'll go uh, just for a second briefly uh, to um, the uh, conventional osteosarcoma case. Uh, this is uh, presented for you to uh, recognize that uh, conventional osteosarcoma, <clears throat> you can have very cellular uh, areas but here again, for contrast sake, we see um, this osteoid uh, formation with uh, associated very atypical <clears throat> osteocytes within the osteoid. So this is clearly uh, bone forming uh, neoplasm. <clears throat> Most of these tend to be high grade um, and have a much more aggressive uh, uh, radiologic appearance. Uh, so they're usually not a uh, diagnostic dilemma uh, from that standpoint, um, unless they're very early stage. Um, but uh, in this situation, the osteosarcoma will uh, butt up against the, uh, the periosteum. It will destroy the, uh, the cortex uh, and eventually will uh, permeate through and create a soft tissue mass in the patient. <clears throat> in contrast, uh, this lesion uh, does not have a lot of bone formation, but I, I show you this case as a radiographic contrast to the uh, chondromyxoid fibroma and the other lesions we've looked at. Uh, why is this not a giant cell tumor? Well, first of all, it's destroying the cortex. It's extending into soft tissue. It, it's Maybe you can even see a little bit of elevation of the periosteum up here, a little bit of a Codman's triangle. But if you look at the margins here, it's very hard to say where the tumor stops and where the normal bone begins. Is it here? Is it here? Uh, 
uh, we can't really tell. There's just a very destructive character to this lesion. Um, and this is a particularly aggressive type of osteosarcoma known as the uh, telangiectatic uh, osteosarcoma. Uh, so here we can see some pre-existing bony uh, 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 trabeculae here surrounded and permeated by this lesion. It's invading uh, in between them. Um, and as we, uh, as we look around, we can occasionally uh, find areas that look like uh, we've probably got tumor osteoid here. So uh, some of this pink tissue around here probably would polarize as osteoid and be convincing uh, for that matter. Now it's called telangiectatic because it's very hemorrhagic. The amount of osteoid is fairly sparse and it tends to have these large uh, blood-filled spaces or telangiectasias uh, that form a part of the mass. Uh, and so finding these long, thin channels of, of uh, blood-filled uh, space uh, would be supportive of that diagnosis of telangiectatic uh, um, osteosarcoma. So that was uh, presented as, as two sort of bone-forming tumor contrasts to our osteoid osteoma and our osteoblastoma case. Then our final case, uh, just a very, uh, presented for just a very simple reason that uh, here we see bone formation uh, in, this, in this tumor. Um, and so is this a, a, uh, an osteosarcoma? Uh, now we've shown you one extraskeletal osteosarcoma from the heart. Uh, could this also be uh, such a case? Uh, well, um, if you called it osteo, you know, extraskeletal osteosarcoma, I wouldn't fault you dramatically. Uh, but the other features that we have here are of uh, a um, lipomatous tumor. This is a, a retroperitoneal tumor. Uh, it's been there for some time. Um, and as we look here in the fatty component of this tumor, uh, we see these fibrous septi with atypical cells uh, we see fatty tissue with, uh, you know, occasional atypical cells. So if our biopsy was from this area, we would make the diagnosis of uh, atypical lipomatous tumor or well-differentiated liposarcoma. Uh, then we could do uh, MDM2 mutational testing or immunohistochemistry. And if that were positive, then we would make the diagnosis of uh, well-differentiated liposarcoma. And in the presence of these spindle-shaped areas, we would say this is a D-differentiated liposarcoma. Now, um, it's well known that in D-differentiated liposarcomas, you can get uh, variable areas of D-differentiation, and that can include areas that look like osteosarcoma. So um, not everything that is osteosarcoma or looks like osteosarcoma is osteosarcoma, um, and this is another one of those situations where um, if you were to do MDM2 mutational testing here, you would find that this is a, a mutated status and thus more likely uh, to represent a, just an osteogenic uh, dedifferentiation in the uh, liposarcoma. So uh, sort of an interesting array of cases uh, with the bone and cartilage formation is kind of our core theme today, uh, illustrating some of the pitfalls and challenges I'm so grateful that you've uh, spent your time with me today. I hope this is useful for us. Uh, we will post the video of this so you can refer back to it. And uh, if you didn't look at the slides beforehand, I certainly encourage you to uh, do so uh, as a review, just to sort of cement the lessons uh, that we've talked about. Um, so one other question uh, about uh, whether histologic findings can differentiate between giant cell tumor and brown cell tumor. Uh, those tend to be very similar histologically. The difference, uh, however, would be location. Uh, giant cell tumor is usually meta-epiphyseal um, and in the right age group. Um, and so uh, that would be the time and place to look for that uh, diagnosis over giant cell tumor. But sometimes uh, you may just have to say, you know, giant cell neoplasm and, and include that in your differential uh, and advise that they check, uh, you know, parathyroid uh, hormone levels. Well, again, thank you very much for joining me today. I'll stick around to answer any, any follow-up questions that you might have, uh, but uh, you're certainly free to go. And we'll look forward to doing this again next month.
If you have suggestions of topics you'd like me to cover and go over with, I'd be happy to search for cases that would illustrate that as well. Um, as uh, I want to make this uh, fruitful for you uh, uh, as well. So thank you.